Welcome, Ben Mama. The year is 1987 and we're looking at a very different version of the Atari that kick-started the whole industry. The much streamlined consumer division was now owned by former Commodore founder Jack Trammell, a man who was as feared by people every bit as much as he was respected. The new Atari Corporation had successfully launched their market-leading ST computer to much fanfare, got the 7800 Pro system back into the market, relaunched the 8-bit computer range with a new look, and was still selling a budget remodel of the Atari 2600. Being the savvy businessman that he was though, Jack was well aware that Atari needed to stay ahead of the curve, and had commissioned his engineering department to come up with a new 16-bit games console to meet the upcoming PC Engine and Sega Mega Drive head-on. There were many rumours in the press of a so-called ST console, but nothing ever materialised. In fact, Atari never ended up releasing a 16-bit console of any kind, unless you count the Lynx handheld of course, and left a 9 year gap between the original release of the 7800 in 1984 and the 64-bit Jaguar in 1993. But that's not to say they didn't dabble with several different solutions though, as I'll endeavour to explain. Now the two main projects to produce an Atari badge 16-bit console have both been covered in separate videos on this channel, so I don't want to cover them in too much detail here. Instead, I'll give you a very brief summary and leave you to click the links in the description to find out more if you wish. The first of these was the Super XE game system, which was conceived as a direct upgrade of the Atari 8-bit computer range that featured a 65C816 CPU, very similar to the Super Nintendo and Apple II GS, and would be 100% backwards compatible. In case you wondered, this is widely believed to be the exact same project as the Atari Mirai, although that's never been officially confirmed. Although all the design work was done on the Super XCGS, it never got near the production phase as it was promptly cancelled due to the availability of the next option. In 1988, Atari were approached by Sega to distribute and market the new 16-bit Mega Drive console in North America. Their previous console, the Master System, had failed in this region, and Sega were hoping that Atari, who at this time had the second largest market share after Nintendo, could do a better job. Talks got to a very advanced stage, in fact it was Atari that came up with the Genesis name, and even set up a new development studio in Lombard, Illinois to create games for it. But the deal ultimately fell through, because Jack Trammell also wanted the marketing and distribution rights for Europe too. Atari's next attempt to deliver a 16-bit console is undoubtedly the best known story of all, but is actually very poorly documented, with little to no concrete information out there. The development of what became known as the Atari Panther started in late 1988, with an anticipated 1991 release, pitting the console as a direct competitor to the Sega Mega Drive and Super Nintendo. Based around a Motorola 68000 CPU, it boasted some seriously impressive specs, and was already being heavily tooted in the press of the time. Interestingly, almost all of this coverage described the Panther as a 32-bit console, probably due to its advanced graphics capabilities, despite the 16-bit CPU. This is an early indication of what was to come with the so-called Bit Wars. So let's have a look at that hardware in a bit more detail, shall we? So, as I said, the Panther featured a Motorola 68000 CPU running at 16MHz, 32K of fast static RAM and 64K of ROM. In the audio department it featured an Ensonic sound chip called Otis, it had 8K reserved solely for sound, a 29-bit digital signal processor with various filters, 32-bit separate voices each with independent volume, 16-bit PCM stereo sound and stereo headphone jacks on the console itself. Graphics-wise, it had a main resolution of 320 x 200 non-interlaced, 32 colours per scanline from a palette of 262,144 colours, 7,860 colours on screen at any one time, hardware scrolling and scaling, 32-bit graphics processor running at 32 megahertz, and 2,000 on-screen sprites at any one time. 
As you can see, the Panther had some seriously powerful hardware for the time that would have been far in advance of anything else on the market. There were questions over the amount of available RAM, but this would have been an easy fix, and had the Panther gone to market, I envisage this would have been up to at least double that, probably quadruple to 128k. There have been comparisons to the Lynx in terms of abilities like hardware scrolling, scaling, palette switching and sprite handling, but the Lynx wasn't actually developed by Atari of course, and the Panther graphics chip was a totally unique design by all accounts. In terms of controllers, the joypad designed for the Panther was later adapted for the Jaguar and was even shown in some very early Jaguar previews. Atari soon announced that they had signed up an array of top developers and publishers such as Domark, US Gold, Psygnosis and Llamasoft in anticipation of a worldwide launch and the expectation was growing, especially in Europe where Atari had been experiencing tremendous success with the ST. Development kits had already been sent out, controllers and casing had gone through the design phase, and the chips were in the early manufacturing stage. I do want to quickly mention at this point that an image of what the Atari Panther would have looked like has been widely circulated and regurgitated across various videos and articles. The one you can see right now on the screen in fact. This is nothing more than a fan-made mock-up, however, it was based on Atari's own official design documents, so it isn't total fantasy. What led to the Panther being cancelled at such an advanced phase? Well, it all depends on who you believe really. And an important disclaimer at this point, there is no officially verified version of events. All we have to go on are the stories of numerous different people involved in the Panther project, who very much seem to disagree with each other. The official story at the time, and indeed the one distributed to the press, was that Atari had abandoned the Panther in favour of the Jaguar, which was in development during the same time, and progressed quicker than anyone expected. Indeed, this statement is backed up by one Martin Brennan, who was not just one of the designers of the Jaguar at Flair, but also helped put together the Panther video chip. Here's some interesting commentary on the machine from the man himself. One of the guys we knew from Sinclair, called Richard Miller, had recently joined Atari. He became a director of Atari in Sunnyvale and had a project called Panther. It wasn't called Panther when I joined though. Panther was the name of the car my wife had just bought, a Panther Callista. And the Panther had no name and I wanted to give it a handle, so it was called Panther. It was actually this that inspired Jack Trammell to name the Flair 2 machine the Jaguar. Flair were of course from the UK and Jack's favourite British car was a Jaguar. The fact both of these are big cats is purely a coincidence, as was the naming of the Lynx naming it for its ability to link up with other machines. Martin went on to say, The design and specification had already been started, and they said somebody's left, here's the concept, and it was only the video part of the chip. There was no sound. It was a novel video architecture that allowed you to create windows of different sizes and different bit depths. Essentially, you didn't have a frame store. It was a composite of frame stores, a kind of smart video frame store. It would have allowed a great deal of sprite style animation, Sprites in general in those days would have been a fixed size, e.g. 16x16. The games looked very spritey because of that. This would have been quite an interesting departure. I wasn't keen on it, but I designed the chip and it was built. But while I was over in California in 89, I actually convinced the bosses at Atari that 3D was the way to go, with the experience we gained on Flare 1. If you didn't just do flat rendering but shaded rendering, you got a 3D appearance. At the time I was seeing pictures in magazines where computers were rendering photorealistic 3D wire meshes and I said these are static images, but they only contain a very few number of polygons. We could take that, animate it and you could produce a game. That was a quantum leap away from the current games. So the Jaguar project was born from the Panther project. In essence, Atari looked at the Panther and looked at what we were promising for the Jaguar and said let's can the Panther project. With the Jaguar so close to being released, it won't surprise you to learn that a number of games were already in development too. Martin Hooley, whose company Magitech Design were making several games for the Panther, including Raiden and Dino Dudes, told me about his memories of it all when I interviewed him some years ago. Atari had hired us to write three games for the Panther and help evaluate the hardware. Then out of the blue one day, we receive a text telling us that it's been cancelled and they wanted us to move all our projects over to the Jaguar and Falcon. We weren't that surprised, as the development hardware never really worked as it should do, and Atari CTO Leonard Trammell would never hear any wrong, making it impossible to give proper feedback. He went on to confirm that two of those games were Dino Dudes and Raiden. 
which were both ported to the Jaguar and Falcon. He believes the third game might have been troubled RPG Damon's Gate, but his memories are hazy on that one. A similar version of events was described by Jim Gregory, founder of Handmade Software, who produced a number of games for both the Lynx and Jaguar, including Awesome Golf, Kasumi Ninja, and Dracula the Undead. He described a development kit that constantly overheated and never worked as it was supposed to, making progress very difficult. Next up, we have Guido Henkel, who came from pretty much nowhere to acquire a Panther dev kit. He went into detail on this in an interview for the Atari.io website. My business partner, Hans Jürgen Brandl, and I were huge Atari ST fans at the time, and it was our main development platform. In 1990, during CES, we visited Atari's exhibitor suite to see what news there was regarding new ST or TT models. By sheer coincidence, we rode the elevator with Atari CEO Jack Trammell. We introduced ourselves and when we left the elevator, Jack instantly put us in touch with one of his developer relations people. It turned out there was no news regarding the STTT line of computers, but he told us they were working on a new console called the Panther. Atari was in the process of signing up developers for the console at the time, and we had just completed an action adventure, which we had originally planned for the ill-fated Conics multi-system. And we're working on Spirit of Adventure, our first full-blown role-playing game. Atari wanted variety in its launch titles and was very interested in getting an RPG on the console, so they added us to their developer program. A couple of months later, we received a shipment from them with a Panther dev kit consisting of a Panther prototype, an Atari TT workstation, and the developer manual. The game we were working on was called The Crypt. It was a first-person dungeon crawler in the vein of Eye of the Beholder, with an Egyptian theme throughout. You were essentially exploring the insides of a pyramid with all its traps and labyrinth-like mazes. I was designing and programming the game at the time, and only had one artist working with me on the game's prototype. We had one level complete when we received word from Atari that the Panther was cancelled and that they had a bleeding edge 64-bit console called the Jaguar in the making that would replace the project. I honestly do not recall a whole lot about the system. RAM may have been an issue, but we had just written the most incredible data compressor in our careers, so I was confident we would not run into many problems there. I loved the fact that we could work on a TT as the master workstation because it allowed me to instantly use the same toolchain I was using for my previous development, and I did not have to find and learn new tools. So from the first day, I was essentially ready to work on the console, and I remember how cool it felt to see my first sprite on the Panther screen. It was just the game's logo. With its hardware sprite zooming capabilities, it was really cool to see just how a few lines of code created a powerful entrance for that logo on the screen. Regarding our development, I do not believe anything has survived. I may have the actual hardware in the attic somewhere still, but no longer have any documentation or source code of the game itself. I've never been one to archive much of my work, which is bad, I know, in retrospect, but never really thought any of my work was all that relevant to be saved for prosperity. I wanted to give Guido's insight on the Panther in full, because it's the most in-depth account we have available. If you want to read more of his thoughts, I've linked the full interview in the description. Now this is where things get really interesting, because the Panther stories provided by the likes of Jim, Guido, Martin, as well as some small anecdotes from Exognosis staff, led to Leonard Trammell appearing on social media to dispute them. As a Tory CTO, he was the man with overall responsibility for the Panther project, and he recalls a very different set of events. There were never any games running on the Panther hardware. There was also no work done on the Panther hardware outside of Atari and Atari contractors. It's simple really, the Panther development kits never worked due to a series of malfunctioning faults within the chips, so we decided to just kill it, as it would have been too much work and expense to fix. In response to this, Jeff Minter, the legendary programmer of Tempest 2000, Defender 2000 and Llamatron, stepped into the argument to take the side of his game's developer brethren. Oh, the dev kits absolutely did work. I had one at home in Wales for a couple of months before it got cancelled, and it worked fine. I did end up with some code that crashed occasionally, but that was likely due to errors on my part rather than flaws in the hardware. Perhaps some of the dev kits were buggy, but mine wasn't, and pretty much worked as advertised. This short statement subsequently returned to Leonard, who then softened his stance somewhat on his initial assertion to find more middle ground. That's very interesting, I have no idea what he could be talking about. The chips we had in Sunnyvale didn't work correctly. 
I suppose that there might have been some work around involving slowing down a clock or modifying some signals to get the chips to limp along, but the chips did not work at all as they were designed to, and the analysis of why indicated it was a significant amount of work to get them right. That was rejected as the Jaguar was so close, and there was simply not enough engineering talent to do both. I wonder what the details of this are, I'm not sure who to ask. One of the only pieces of evidence we have on the Panther is an article that appeared in the One magazine in the UK that actually gave us a big preview on the machine alongside the headline that it had already been cancelled, which is certainly a quite unusual way of reporting. In this article they claim to have seen a Jaguar development kit fully working at Atari's UK office in Slough, Berkshire, and were indeed shown several early games and demos running on it. This very much suggests that Lennon's version of events is untrue, but without definitive proof, the matter can never be truly settled. Regardless of which version of events you believe, many people who worked at Atari during this time believe that cancelling the Panther was a huge mistake. One such person is former Atari UK marketing manager and Atari Jaguar product manager Daryl Still. I never knew the full business reasons behind the Panther's cancellation. In hindsight, it's easy to claim that it was a vital reason for the Jaguar's ultimate failure, but if all things had been equal, we'd had Panther, decent stock and a good run up then I suspect some things like developer and publisher involvement would have been much smoother for Jaguar. So in terms of those games then, just what was in development? Well I already mentioned Guido Henkel's Dungeon Master-esque RPG The Crypt, as well as Raiden, Dino Dudes and possibly Damon's Gate from Imagitech Design. Jeff Minter was experimenting with the hardware and created a demo called Antelope Attack to show off the sprite rendering hardware of the machine, but he hoped to make a sequel to the groundbreaking Atari classic Star Raiders for the Panther. Interestingly, one small part of his Panther development kit does still remain, hidden within the ROM for Defender 2000 on the Jaguar, and that is Plasma Pong, a demo he created for the console and then used as an easter egg in this game later on. Plasma Pong can actually be played and accessed via a cheat code you put in on the high score screen. Atari themselves produced a 3D asteroid demo and it's been rumoured that the Atari Falcon ports of Roadwright 4 wheel drive and Steel Talons were originally Panther projects. The One magazine reported that Domark were doing a port of the Atari arcade game Pit Fighter, Psygnosis were coding a conversion of Shadow of the Beast and Strider 2 was coming from US Gold. Currently there are known to be at least 7 Panther development kits out there. At the point of making this video, nobody has got one working or been able to get them to do anything useful, but work is ongoing. Given the talented retro community got a full blown emulator up and working for the unreleased Conics Multisystem, which does share some close links to the Panther, there is definitely still hope. It doesn't help that there isn't anybody out there at the moment to give any useful knowledge on getting the Panther running or any kind of documentation to help with this either. There's no doubting that the Panther is the biggest what if in the history of Atari and this story throws up far more questions than it does answers. I for one continue to be fascinated by the Panther and hope that one day I can update this video with some kind of positive breakthrough. And that rounds up the story of the unreleased Atari Panther. What are your thoughts on this now legendary console? Do you think Atari were right to cancel it in favour of the Jaguar or do you think they completely missed the boat? I always love to hear the thoughts and views of my audience so please get typing in that comment section. Before I go though, I must thank all of my loyal patrons for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible. I must give special thanks to the following patrons in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Mitchell Valentino, Neptune, Seth A. Robinson, Carl Olsen, Ozzy B, D Vaughan, DOS Gamerman and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now. You can get access to host extra content, including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights, and much more besides. I've been the Laird, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.